sons, not the daughters, right? Make sure that her husband never has to worry about her messing around on him. In the same way, Vulcan woke up in the early morning. Of course, the irony is he's about to tell Cyclopses and Vulcan and Vulcana, of course, this is where we get over Vulcan, uh, Volcano from, right? Um, that the Cyclopses, whatever it is you're doing, you need to stop it now. It's time for us to go to work, and the Cyclopses will all go to work. And they're going to make weaponry for Aeneas so that he can go and slaughter, of course, all kinds of people. And housewives are going to be referenced several times, and mothers as being really worried about what's about to take place, as war, of course, always is that way. We're told that Evander awakes, um, and he will speak. Uh, he goes off in, in the company with two with two watchdogs. We're reminded of uh, we're reminded of Telemachus and his dogs when he walked in the Odyssey. And then to Aeneas, also an early riser. The king starts in at line 555. Greatest chief of the Trojans for while you're alive, he says, I'll never consider Troy and its kingdom conquered. It's wonderful stuff, right? Troy never actually lost, even though, of course, it got burned up. He says, as long as you're alive, Troy is alive, which is, of course, going to be a pat on the back to all Romans to say, in the end, the Trojan War was won by the Trojans because the Romans are the Trojans, and, of course, the Romans defeated the Greeks. He says, I'll never consider Troy and its kingdom conquered. Our power to reinforce you in war is, however, slight. He says the problems for us are serious ones. They have this Mazentus who is a part of it, once a king. He did terrible things, like for example, we're told at 570 and following, he would take a corpse, a dead body, and he would tie it up um, really tight to a living body and, and then make the living body have to live out until it slowly died, very slowly. It, it, it died by inches is the way he will say it. Um, breathing the decaying corpse. It's a horrific thing. Well, they got together and they threw him out. And But it, it, what, what he says to Aeneas is, we need to go to Eturia. They will help us. Now, we don't know a lot about these, these Eturians, uh, but we do know they're a fighting, a fighting force. But, good, good news, he says, a prophet has not allowed this fighting force to go and fight against... Um, um, the, uh, the, the uh, tribes, because they've been told by this prophet, a foreigner has to lead you. Well, good luck for, uh, oh, for Aeneas, right? And then he says, um, uh, and, and he says, um, uh, uh, again, Evander, sounding very much like Nestor in the Iliad, he says, right before line 600, old age, sluggish cold, played out with the years, has me in its grip, denies me the command, my strength is too far gone for feats of arms. I'd urge my son to accept, he says, and run and run this army. But his blood is mixed, half Sabine, thanks to his mother, and so Italian. He says, you're the one whose age had breathed the fates approved, the one the powers called, speaking to Aeneas. March out on your mission, bravest chief of the Trojans, now the Italians too. What's more, he says, I will pair you with Pallas, my hope, my comfort, his son. Under your lead, follow these lines. They're important for our understanding of this text as a propedeutic instructional. Under your lead, let him grow hard to a soldier's life and the rough work of war. Let him get used to watching you in action. Admire you as his model from his youth. To him, I will give 200 horsemen now, fighting hearts of oak, our best. And Pallas will give you 200 more in Pallas's name. Notice this idea. Evander the old man will say, Take my boy and show him how to be a proper soldier. In other words, a role model. And this is huge for your notes because this is what Virgil wants in this text. He wants young would-be Roman warriors when they're young boys to look at this and say, I want to grow up to be just like Aeneas. That's the whole point. We will say later and remind ourselves of those lines we learned in our junior year from Longfellow's Psalm of Life, Lives of Great Men All Remind Us. We can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Um, their eyes, um, while they're talking, we're told that Aeneas and his pal, um, Achates, their eyes are fixed on the ground. It's interesting that this is kind of a motif. We saw this in Book 7 at line 290 as well, when you're thinking and your eyes are on the ground, right? Um, and they had had really seriously um, worries about joining their troops with anybody other than Evander. And then all of a sudden, Venus will send a sign, lightning and thunder, a blood red sky, and Aeneas will say, oh, don't worry, don't ask my friend at 625. Don't ask me, I beg you, what these portents bring. The heavens call for me. My goddess mother promised to send this sign if war were breaking out and bring me armor down through the air forged, forged by Vulcan himself to speed me on in battle. But, oh, dear gods... Then he pauses and he says this out loud. Oh, dear gods, line 631, 
What slaughter threatens the poor Laurentine people? What a price in bloodshed, Turnus, you will pay me soon. How many shields and helmets and corpses of the brave you'll churn beneath your tides, O oh Father Tiber. All right then, you Rutilians, beg for war, break your packs of peace. Notice two things. It's hard to know whether we're reading this as Aeneas is sad or he's excited and happy that so many people are about to get jacked. Notice the other thing. He blames the whole thing of this war on the Rutilians who broke the, pra the pact of peace. Well, of course, <laughs> this, is, this is pure propaganda if ever there was propaganda, right? Hello, Aeneas shows up and demands, of course, the right of living in the land, and it will be Latinus who will give him then the right to do that. Well, obviously there's pacts of peace that were created through threat, no question, right? Um, the idea then is that he's going to get some horses, he's going to get some gifts, um, and, um, and th we're told that the fear begins to build because a, certain ru a sudden rumor flies through the little town. Mothers are struck with terror and pray and re-echo prayers. A little, bit, uh, a little bit later we're going to hear this echoed again. We have Evander's last words to Pallas' his son, and these will be his last words. At line 660, if only Jove, he says, again, sounding very much like Nestor in the Iliad, if only Jove would give me back the years all gone and make me the man I was, killing the front rank, the front ranks, um, uh, uh, he says. Um, it, he says, uh, I, I was a great king. He talks about the king that he killed and sent down to hell. He says, um, all, of those, all of those lives, he says, I stripped away from uh, this king Eurylus and all his armor to... Oh, if only, he says, then no force could ever tear me now from your dear embrace, my boy. Um, and he says, there's going to be so many widows that are going to be left. He says, I implore you, he says, he prays, I implore you, hear a father's prayers. If your commands will keep my palace safe, and if the fates intend to preserve my boy, and if I live to see him, join him again, why then I pray for life. I can suffer any pain on earth, but if you are threatening some disaster fortune, line 683, let me break this brutal life off now, now, while anxieties waver and hopes for the future fade. While you, my beloved boy, my lone delight come lately, I still hold you in my embrace. Oh, let no graver news arrive and pierce my ears. A moment of pathos in any of us as parents who have sent away our children into the field of battle as soldiers, we understand exactly what it is that he's feeling at this moment. Then, we're told, he collapses, he faints and his servants bore him quickly into the house. We have the cavalry. We have Pallas as a brilliant young man. We have mothers trembling, standing on ramparts at, at, at line 700 or so. And the, off they get ready to go. By the way, this is, of course, the response to that long list of all of those, all of those uh, warriors of, of Tyrannus um, at the end of Book 7. Here we have now Aeneas and his great warriors. We're told then that off they, off they go, and at line 715, the goddess Venus, lustrous among the cloud banks, bearing her gifts, approached when she spotted Aeneas, her son, alone, off in a glade's recess by the frigid stream. She hailed him suddenly there before him, and she says at line 720, Look, just forged to perfection by my husband's skill, the gifts I promise. There's no need now, my son, to flinch from fighting, swaggering Latin ranks or challenging Savage Turnus to a duel. This will be, by the way, how the Aeneid will ultimately end, with the duel between the two of them. With that, we're told, Venus reached to embrace her son, much different from earlier in Carthage, when she ran away from him, and set the brilliant armor down before him under a nearby oak. Very much like Achilles, of course, in Iliad 18, we're told that Aeneas takes delight immediately when he looks at the armor, and then we have the famous shield of Aeneas. Now, in many ways, this is very similar to the shield story in Iliad 18. In other ways, it's fundamentally different, especially in the description of what's on the shield. For the, uh, for the Greek Achilles, we have stories of cities, two cities that are going to be in contest with each other. We have all kinds of domestic things happening, and it's kind of general, and it's very vague as to specifics what's going on here in the shield of Aeneas, something much different. To just read specifically now from the Aeneid, line 738, 736, 738. There, he, uh, Virgil says, 
There is the story of Italy, Rome and all her triumphs. There the fire god forged them, well aware of the seers and schooled in times to come. That word schooled is significant, that Fagos translate that, that, that word that way. That is to say, the, the, the artwork of the shield is instructional about what's about to come. And what is it? Well, wars. <laughs> this isn't going to shock us. The wolf, of course, the, uh, the wolf that will take care of Romulus and Remus, the twin boys that are dugs. Well, there's a famous sculpture if you visit Rome that you get to see. The Sabine women, we, we are reminded that Rome will do a whole lot of what it does early on by just basically taking those Sabine women against their will and, of course, raping them and making them uh, their, the, the, the mothers of the future generations to come, right? We then have a whole list of things um, he rushing headlong against the steel line 760 in freedom's name. Um, we've got the Gauls that are mentioned. We've got dancing priests at line 775. Uh, we've got um, Cato mentioned giving his laws at 785. By the way, if you want full detail about all of this, Fagels does uh, provide us. Uh, we have, a, we have an intro, a set of introductory comments by Barnard Knox, uh, brilliant introductory comments in all three of these editions we're working with. And Knox has, a, has, has a, a series of comments about the shield of Achilles section, and I recommend that you take a look at it. There's some dolphins swimming. Dolphins are a, a very favorite of, um, um, marine animal for the Romans. They come back again and again. And here, line 790, here in the heart of the shield, the bronze ships, the Battle of Actium, the great battle that, of course, will happen the 2nd of September in the year 31 BCE, when uh, um, Caesar Augustus defeated Mark Anthony, Cleopatra, the combined troops of Egypt, and it was from then on that Augustus will become the great leader and Rome will become the great empire. You can see it all, the world drawn up for war. On one flank, Caesar Augustus leading Italy into battle, the Senate and people too, the gods of hearth and home. We're told at line 801, opposing them comes Anthony, leading on the riches of the Orient. Uh, we've said already, the suspicion of all things east by the west, here, here it will be. Troops of every stripe, victor over the nations of the dawn and blood red shores, and his retinue, Egypt, all the might of the east, and Bactra, the end of the earth, trailing in his wake that outrage, that Egyptian wife. Of course, we're supposed to think back to Tido, aren't we, right? All launch in his one, whipping the whole sea to foam. Of course, um, the idea is that we will have the great victory, the tremendous victory. It's only 13 years prior to the actual publishing of the Aeneid in, in, in 18 Common Era. And then we're told Caesar at line 837. Caesar, in triple triumph, born home through the walls of Troy, was paying eternal vows of thanks to the gods of Italy. Caesar himself, a few lines later at 841, throned at brilliant Apollo's snow white gates, reviews the gifts brought on by the nations of the earth, and he mounts them high on the lofty temple doors as the vanquished people move in a slow file, their dress, their arms as motley as their tongues. This is that xenophobia we've spoken about before and fear of the foreign, the need to dominate the foreign. But notice, we are told that Virgil, when he died, before he died, right before he died, he said he wanted this manuscript destroyed. And it was Caesar Augustus who said, absolutely no way. We may be reading a reason, a line why. The book ends with the lines at line 855, such vistas, the god of fire forged across the shield that Venus gives her son. He fills with wonder. He knows nothing of these events, but takes delight in their likeness. Again, maybe this is why he had to walk through that gate of, of uh, ivory and and he's going to forget, right, much of what he's been told by Anchises, his father, in book six, at the end of book six. He knows nothing of their likeness. Lifting onto his shoulders now the fame and fates of all his children's children. The final lines of book eight. They are really important for Roman readers because we immediately remind ourselves that in the story that Aeneas tells in, uh, in Aeneas 2, he says that he picked up his old father, Anchises, and he threw him over his shoulder walking out of Troy. Here now we have the lifting onto Aeneas' shoulders, the fame and the fates of all his children's children. In other words, this is a poem that is about a hero, but a hero that's carrying the weight, literally, of the Roman Empire on his shoulders. And by extension, of course, Virgil is going to say um, Caesar Augustus is doing the exact same thing, continuing in that tradition. All right, that's the book. Let's now work at level two and three quickly. 2A, obvious messages, alliances, right? 
especially with those you trust, are the key if you're going to build empire and win wars. To get what you want, another major message. To overcome, right, to get what you want, to overcome great challenges, great odds, this is what defines heroes, both Hercules as well as Juno, as, as well as Aeneas. Because why? Well, they both got to overcome what Juno's throwing at them. Another major message here is that mothers and fathers, they hate to see their children go off into war, right? Of course, in the, Il, in the uh, Aeneid, it's, it's, for the most part, it's, it's men going off. I remember Camellia is mentioned at the end of Book 7, right? But this idea of how tragic it is to have to say goodbye to a son. Evander will say goodbye to Pallas and we'll never see him again. Of course, the other message that we have to say, because it's a central motif of this, of this poem, is fighting and dying in a war is a glorious thing if it's done to propagate the rise and the extension of the Roman Empire. Well, it to be the symbolism, it's self-evident, isn't it, the shield, the shield represents the history of Rome and everything about it, especially that battle at Actium that will be the defining moment, right, in the history of the Roman Empire, according to Virgil, right? Another symbol is Hercules himself. He is a fighter, he is a struggler, but, of course, he's set up juxtaposed against Juno, very much like Prometheus. He will not always reverence the gods. He will fight against them, and in some ways, of course, Aeneas will be seen as having to do the same, overcoming, while at the same time hoping to placate Juno, right? He does sacrifice the white pigs and all of that, right? The ironies at level 2B, well, Aeneas, of course, says that the Latins are the ones who broke the peace pact, not him, and that's why now we've got to have slaughter. It's a contrivance through and through, of course. Turnus has every reason to get seriously fired up about what Aeneas has, uh, has done. The other interesting irony here, and it's just a bizarre one, it's oftentimes gone unspoken, is that we were just told that the god Vulcan says to his wife Venus, if you had asked me, I would have made sure that Troy would have never fallen and Aeneas could still be living in Troy. Of course, for Virgil, that won't work because we need Troy to fall so that Aeneas will take this journey, ultimately find his way to the site where Rome ultimately will be. Right? But there is a bit of irony there, isn't there? At level 3A, well, we've mentioned it already, relationships to the Iliad, Book 18, and the Shield of Aeneas. We've mentioned the similarities. We've also mentioned the differences. In the Odyssey, how do we, how do we kind of relate this? Well, in the Odyssey, notice how so much is about the importance of getting home. Uh, of course, for Odysseus as well as Telemachus when he is away, right? for example, with Menelaus and Helen and that kind of thing. Notice here the importance of building a home, because obviously... Uh, Aeneas can't go back to Troy. It's over. Bringing the Troy to Rome. Hamilton's mythology is as well something we can relate to here and all the stories, the great stories of Hercules that we outlined there. What are your favorite texts about armor, about swords? We will study a very old film called Excalibur that will play the game of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table later. We'll, we will get to that. Um, lots of the video games that you play will celebrate the whole notion of you have to choose your armor, choose your shield. I had students that say, Oh, so in some of these games I play, I've got to choose my armor, choose my shield. That shield, of course, that game that we're playing, the Iliad and the Aeneid, no question. A final 3B question. I think this will make sense to you. What was the time you had to overcome Juno? I hope that you understand now what I'm asking. How about this as a question? What is your shield? What is the object that, or the concept that protects you? What is the item that tells your story? in the way that the shield of Aeneas and the shield of Achilles, but really the shield of Aeneas, defines who he is. Right? What was a time, another, you knew this one was coming, what was a time that you made good alliances and what was a time that you made really bad alliances? That passage from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil companionships, corrupt good morals, that idea. Sometimes we make good alliances, sometimes not so good alliances. How about this one? Do you feel like you carry the future on your shoulders? Virgil wanted young Roman soldiers, young boys who would be studying this poem, to definitely have that sense of legacy. Aeneas is carrying Anchises when he leaves Troy on his shoulders. Aeneas, when he's carrying that weaponry, he literally is carrying the future of the Roman people. To what degree do you feel like you are carrying the future of your town, your state, your region, your country, the world, on your shoulders? Right? And, of course, that notion that Pallas is instructed, watch Aeneas and be just like him. I quoted those lines from Longfellow's Psalm of Life. 
um, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another sailing our life silo made, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother seeing shall take heart again. That notion of if I were to have you go in front of a bunch of eighth graders as high school seniors and I were to have you say to them, live your life through high school the way I live my life with the same types of choices, not the same choices, but the same types of choices, the way I lived with courage and with honor. Are you capable of saying that? Because this poem says, they're always watching. And of course we know the way you became, learned how to become a high school student was in your middle school years watching high school students, the way they talked, the way they acted, the way they carried themselves. It's an interesting question. Okay, well that's book eight. We're now geared up, we call it the Ersteia in, in the Iliad, the preparations for battle, the preparations for the great fight that's about to happen. We are going to have, in fact, in book nine now, turning to the battle itself. There will be a reason why Evander and those mothers were concerned in book eight. We're going to hear about this. We're going to meet a mom, um, Eurylis, uh, Eurylis's mom, who is going to just be destroyed and devastated by the death of her son. We know that a lot of devastation and killing is coming, and so to that degree, this will break our heart. The Romans love this stuff, though. Why? Because they looked back and they said, the only way that Rome becomes the great empire that it becomes is because they had to jack a whole lot of people on the way there. And therefore, all of that death, carnage, slaughter, it was worth it. Come back and we'll uh, go to work with Book Nine and the great hero-villain Turnus. Thank you.